great story. Yeah. So when you went down to Boise, what was that like? That was a. That I love Boise. Boise was a. Um, it was a. It was. It was a smaller unit. There was a bunch of uh, folks from, from Idaho City, John Kramer, Herb Korn, Bobby Montoya. Uh, th those were kind of the nucleus of, of old Idaho City smoke jumpers. They had built the, the uh, Boise smoke jumper base when they closed down Idaho City. And uh, um, I believe that was in 19... It was about three years before I got there, four years. It was a year before I started jumping that they had moved to Boise in the new base, which is the base now that the BLM jumpers use there in Boise at the airport. So it was a lot smaller base. It was um, at that time Lowell Hansen, another Missoula jumper, was the, ba there was the base manager at the time. And, um, and Lowell and I really were, you know, we hit it off really well. And I like Lowell a lot. He was a, he's a good man, and uh, and we kept our friendship all the way through the uh, to the time that I after I went to Missoula, still do. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was a smaller base. Uh, it was a lot more lax, more relaxed, and we just had a. We, it was a fun base. It was a, a just a fun base. Was it a Forest out. Service or a BLM base? Boise National Forest. Uh, smoke jumpers. That's where we were at. So how many years down there? Well, they closed it. In, in 1979, they did uh, the National Smoke Jumper Study. And uh, that's when they concluded the study. And at that time, that's when they closed Cave Junction. Uh, they closed La Grande. They wanted to, they closed Boise. They wanted to close Winthrop. They wanted to close Grangeville. And they wanted to close West Yellowstone. What they wanted to do, what the study indicated, was that all there was a need for was four mega bases, and the four mega bases would have been Redding, uh, Redmond, McCall, and Missoula. Region one said, "No way, we're not going to do that. Uh, we need West Yellowstone. We need them there all the time, as as well as we need Grangeville." So they didn't. They, they did, just didn't do it. And uh, in the same way with Winthrop, up in Region 6, they, they said, no, we're not, we're not we'll, we'll do, uh, we'll do La Grande, but we're not going to do Winthrop. So Cave Junction, uh, unfortunately, was closed. I think that was a big mistake. And then, uh, like I said, uh, La Grande and Boise. Well, that study, was that, that was done at the national level? That was a national level study. It was kind of interesting that <laughs> that the, you know they didn't pull a power trip on them, but some of the regions said no. So when they closed Boise, uh, you know that was a bona fide rift reduct reduction in force. So I had a choice to go back to McCall or get terminated from government work or seek a like position somewhere else, and that's how I got a direct reassignment to Missoula as a squad leader, and that was in nineteen. 79. So uh, that was your first time being in any overhead position? I mean, I, I had already full time been, overhead? Or? Yeah, I, had, I was already a. Uh, I, I became a, a, a squad leader with a 13 and 13 in uh, 1976. Oh, okay. So I was already three years a squad leader. So that was. Do you, you, you have a family by then? No. So, no. you, but you were moving lock, stock, and barrel up to Missoula. Yeah. Now, now was that full time year round or just? No, it was, it, was, it was a 13 and 30. What does that mean? Uh, 13 guaranteed pay periods, 13 called when needed. It's career status, you're in career, you have insurance, all the benefits, uh, but it's not a permanent full time, a PFT. And is that, when you say, is that the same as career conditional? No. I, hear, I hear guys talk about a that. A career conditional, no. Okay, this is more, this is, more permanent. Than it's very permanent. Okay. You've got career competitive status. So in a base like Missoula, how many of the 13 and 13 people would there be in the, in the force there? In Missoula? Yeah. When I was there, 
Most of the 13 and 13s, well, all of the 13 and 13s were squad leaders. There, there were no 13 and 13 GS6s. There was 13 and 13, all the GS7 squad leaders were 13 and 13s. The foremans were GS9s at the time. They, they were permanent full-time. So how many squad leaders are we talking about and how many foremen? Well, there was two squad leaders per function, so two for the loft, two for operations, uh, two for uh, load masters, and two for training. So you got eight squad leaders and then a foreman for each one of those functions? Mm -hmm. And then the, the main person the, in charge? The base manager and then there was an assistant. Larry Eisman, when I went there, Larry Eisman was the superintendent and Larry uh, um, Nelson was the the assistant. He was a GS uh, GS ten maybe, and Eisman was a, a GS twelve. And then technically, does that did, did Eisman's job the the base manager? Did that was that part of the regional office or how did how, what's the connection there? Where, what's the okay? Part? I actually became the base manager after Eisman. Right. Okay. The the base manager um, works for the operations the regional operations, fire operations. Okay. So it, it does work for the regional office. It's not direct uh, connected to a, to a force. The other interesting thing is that in Region 1, the Missoula base manager is, the, the reason they call it a superintendent, program manager, is that you have program oversight, not direct supervision, but program oversight for the Grangeville and West Yellowstone junk bases. Because it's a regional program. Did it similar setup in the other regions? Uh, the other regions, uh, yes. Okay. No, actually, no. Region Region Six has uh, Redmond and and uh, Winthrop and NCSB, and they're independent of each other. Okay. So you you showed up in Missoula. Now the year was what year? That would have been 1979. 1979. And what kind of fire year was that? You know, uh, all of, most of the fire seasons were, you know, were busy. You know, we we uh, the, the, uh, later on in my career, like when I was a base manager, I saw some real slow ones. But for the most part, during the the seventies and the eighties, uh, you know, we were we were relatively busy. The seventies, mid seventies, were very busy. Seventy seven was a bumper year. In, uh, in in California and, and uh, well throughout the Northwest and Alaska. Yeah. Uh, Seventy seven was the first time that that there was over a million acres burned in Alaska. Well, uh, so how many years did you operate as a squad leader? And did you become a foreman, or what happened? Well, uh, what what happened? Uh, I want to go right right back to Boise a couple uh, a little bit. Uh, well, in Boise, I was on the, the uh, there was a detail that went to Alaska for the, the whole fire season, for the, the whole Alaska fire season, and I was on that detail three years, and, and that was pretty significant. I had an uh, enormous amount of jumps in, in, uh, in Alaska in 76, 77, and 78. Uh, then when, uh, what, I, I stayed in, uh, in Missoula as a squad leader there, I was a training, I worked for Bill Aldrich at the time, he was a the training foreman, and I worked in training the whole time, and, and then in, uh, in 19, uh, let me think, in 1983, I had already been on the Silver Crew, Silver City Crew, with Frank Sanders for three years, and that was kind of neat because I got to go back home and, and uh, you know, be, jump on the Gila, which was my what the force that I started on. And before we get into what happened after that, I have to tell my my favorite Frank Sanders story. Yeah. Everybody knows Frank Sanders. 